Hello viewers, it's uh, Tuesday evening, 8 o'clock, and it's The Tonight Show with Avzal Akram. Welcome to the show. Um, and tonight uh, we're going to be talking to our guest uh, uh, who's in the studio uh, about education, uh, different types of education. But the key thing is going to be the methods of learning. You know, we're, we're, we're used to going from a very young age into a school, sitting into a classroom, 30 maybe 40, maybe 20, different numbers in a classroom with a teacher at the front with a chalk on a board. Nowadays it's a whiteboard, yeah, with a pen on a whiteboard, but it's classroom-based learning. And there are other different ways of learning, so we're going to talk about that. But before we do that, um, just want to congratulate you all. I know over the last three weeks you've been uh, joining me on my show and we've been talking about politics and we're all sick and tired about politics and we know everything there is. But you know what? What's happened over the last four years? We've had all these number of elections, including the referendum and three general elections now, is that a lot of our public now are actually aware of what it means, you know, what, what our policies and what the issue with Europe was and how important voting is. And uh, I'm hoping you all did get out and vote and you used your vote for the best party you think. Uh, we have the results now. Yes, um, the Conservatives have uh, won the election, as I'm sure you're fully, fully aware, with a 80-seat uh, majority. And uh, today was the first day back in Parliament. Um, where the uh, new members of parliament are being uh, sworn in um, for their allegiance to uh, uh, the Queen and to the country um, before they start um, the business. I believe on Thursday will be the Queen's speech and then on Friday will be the first day or the second day of debating the Queen's speech, which uh, actually means the legislation that government wants to put through will be agreed on what they want to do in the next uh, five years of this uh, government. And Fingers crossed, hopefully no more general elections for another five years. Yeah, I, I creep fingers crossed because you know what? Anything could happen, anything could happen, you know. Um, there is talk that this Conservative government might change legislation again and put the uh, control of calling a general election back into the hands of the Prime Minister. Um, David Cameron took that away in the coalition government where they said we would have a fixed term parliament, so a general election would be fixed every five years and you can't change that unless two thirds of the uh, members of parliament voted to do so. Um, and that became a bit of an issue over the last uh, six months when uh, time and time again the government wanted to call election but the opposition party wouldn't support it. Sounded very strange because opposition parties usually do want an election but in this case they weren't. And therefore, I believe I'm hearing on the grapevine that uh, that might be one of the new uh, legislations that look to change. But let's wait and see what's in the Queen's speech. But look, I don't want to talk too much about politics. Let's get back to our topic today of education. Um, next week will be our uh, final show before Christmas. And next week will be a Christmas special. And I'll say a little bit more about that towards the end of the show. But let me introduce our guest for today. It's uh, Tahir Khan. Tahir, welcome to the show. Thank you, Afzal. And Tahir is a specialist on skills development in education and works in the corporate sector. Um, and so uh, let's see. Uh, Tahir, tell us a little bit about what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? All right. So um, on a day-to-day -day basis, Afzal, um, I help companies understand uh, new, new types of learning methods on how to train uh, their employees from, from entry level up to C-level. And uh, we also have recently started working with a lot of educational ed institutions. So, for example, schools, universities, uh, to kind of try and flip the way that children learn in order to um, enhance their knowledge retention, um, as well as uh, the way that they uh, digest information. I mean, uh, in, in many cases in, in learning and development, um, assessments are a huge part. So, uh, uh, with, with the company that I work with at the moment, we're helping uh, corporates and educational institutions uh, come up to scratch, basically, with all the new technologies. Okay. And I know you have a new form of uh, learning, and we'll talk about that towards mm -hmm. the end, because I want to actually lead up to and talk about all the different types of learning. And I briefly touched on it in my introduction when I said uh, classroom-based learning, yeah. because we all, to a certain extent, do classroom-based learning, because we all go to school. Oh, yeah. Every all day, right? even at so, home, it's still classroom-based learning. So is that the most learning, popular yeah. method of learning? Um, so... I mean, it, it's the most used, I'd say. Um, but what, what we're finding, a lot of people, a lot of schools, even uh, corporates, they're learning that it's more about learning by doing. So what you're learning through textbooks, in theory, it's now about putting that into practice and seeing what really works in the real world. Um, so it's not just, OK, my teacher has told me this, and then you just go off and use it for the rest of your life. Because if, 
if you don't test it, if you don't put the theory into practice, you don't know how much of that theory is true um, generally and necessarily to yourself as an individual. So each individual uh, has a different way of learning. Many of them, uh, many of them are audiovisual. Some of them are practical. Some of our, some some learn literally just by listening to someone and taking on advice. Um, so what we're trying to conquer, uh, I like to say, is figuring out what works best for who, and then how to then continuously help them once you've learned about them. So you're looking to make bespoke, tailor-made packages for individuals based on their learning. Uh techniques, the, the way they learn, the way they consume information, um, that's the sort of thing you put together? Um, well, yes. So with the company I work with, we work with in two parts. Either you can provide us content and we create that bespoke package, or you can tell us what you need and you can actually use the software that we've created for you to then go do it yourself. So for example, for, for companies or schools that can't afford uh, uh, tens of thousands of pounds for 10 to 15 minute scenario based learning simulations. Uh, they can then for a fraction of that price go and do it themselves without knowing how to code or any graphical knowledge etc. Okay, we'll come back to that and we'll use some live examples on that later on in the show. But I want to move back to the classroom um, mm -hmm. based learning. Um, because obviously that's been something that's been used for, I would say, centuries, if you like, yeah. yeah? Um, probably will be going forward as well un until oh, we, I, I until we dramatically right. change yeah. the way we educate our children. And with modern technology, that may well happen, actually. You know, it may well happen that a physical school may not be required anymore. Um, and it may just be online from the comfort of your own home or something. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. But can you talk a little bit about the benefit of classroom-based learning where you have 20, 30 people, uh, smaller groups maybe even, um, with a teacher, lecturer, um, a presenter um, in front of them, um, talking to them either through textbooks or verbally. What, what are the advantages of that method? So the advantages um, as of today are, are generally being able to, to bounce off of each other. So if you've got a classroom, so let's say 20, 30 students, uh, one student might not necessarily understand something as quickly or as easily as, as another. They will have that student to bounce off of as well. Some, sometimes you'll have the teacher, you'll be able to interact with the teacher and ask more questions. Whereas uh, simulation-based learning or, or, uh, or textbook learning, you can't necessarily ask questions, you have to look for them yourselves. So classroom-based learning provides that interactive environment in the real world there and then. Um, again, bouncing off of people. And, and also, um, when you are bouncing off of people, they may explain something to you in an easier way for you to understand than the teacher may have. Okay. Or the teacher may be able to do that mm. in comparison to, uh, let's say, what another student has said. They've reiterated what the teacher has said, and the teacher might say, okay, not exactly that, and then correct the uh, misunderstanding. And I suppose there's a, an element, a little bit of a competition there as well, which drives you on because you know you want to finish your better work before your friend next door. Oh yeah, or so on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And you know, my daughter always comes home and says, "Daddy, I finished, or I've done this and I've done that," and that, I suppose, creates. Um, whereas if you're on your own, um, sometimes you're struggling. But in a classroom, if you're struggling, you see everyone else around you struggling, it probably gives you that bit of a comfort that I'm not the only one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's definitely that. Um, if, if you are struggling, you're highly unlikely to be the only one. Some, some of them may, may be quiet, some of them may speak out. If you're not the type to speak out, maybe the person next to you is. And so you're thinking the you. question, but your friend asks it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you think, thank God, yeah, I've got that. Exactly. Uh, I suppose, and yeah, so there is that, it's like you say, is that camaraderie there. It's a whole, t it's a team effort and so on in there. Yeah. Um, I suppose one of the other disadvantages would be that the, I say kids, but it's, it's all individuals as well, whether you're an adult or a child in, in any classroom-based learning. If you, if you pick up something fast, you can only really move at the speed of the slowest person to a certain extent because you can't leave anyone behind. So that does slow some of your, as an individual, maybe some of your learning down. Or you might find it too easy compared to what you're doing. So you've got to sort of work at the median of the class. Um, well, yes. I mean, it, it's funny you say that, actually. Um, I have um, a younger cousin of mine who's currently going through that exact problem in school. Um, so he's taking uh, math, uh, maths classes, uh, where it's a general class. But um, there are a few students that are slowing down the whole class because they can't seem to grasp the concept. Uh, in many cases, it, 
may be a simple concept. But again, simple has a different definition from person to person. Of course. Um, so the fact that they're finding something difficult is holding the rest of the class on from moving forward because the teacher then concentrates on them because obviously the teacher's not going to leave anyone behind. Sure. Um, and again, going back to what the classroom does do in terms of competitiveness, it's not only about finishing first or being left behind. It's students will want to learn in order to show everyone I'm just as smart as you are. So in terms of that uh, classroom, uh, I, I think there are a lot of it positives. Helps as well. Um, but there are always going to be negatives. The, well, whatever we do, there will always be positives and negatives. Okay. Well, hold that thought. Viewers, we're going to go for a short break now. Um, so do stay tuned in. When we come back, we'll start looking at how, from the classroom-based learning, we've actually moved into other modes of learning as well. And we'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of those. It's your show, as I say every week. Uh, feel free to call in. The number's at the bottom of the screen. And if you want to share your experience with us, or if you want to ask a simple question, then either Di or I will try and answer that for you. So go and get a quick cuppa and... See you soon. Hello, viewers. Uh, welcome back to the second part of the Tonight Show with Avzal Akram here tonight. And we're talking about education. We're talking about different methods of learning. And in the first part, we were talking to our guest, uh, Dyer, about classroom-based learning, which I think we've all done in some concept, whether here or, or, or in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. You know, we, we have sat in a classroom with a number of people, with a teacher at the front, um, talking to us through textbooks and so on. Um, and to be honest, that's probably going to continue for a great number of years come because it's actually a cost-effective way of teaching a number of people. Um, but I do believe uh, as, as years go by, maybe decades go by, um, that will probably be replaced by something else. Uh, what quite, we don't know. And uh, Dai is going to talk to us a little bit about something new that they're looking to launch and maybe that's what it will replace by or maybe something else after that as well. But let's move on from classroom-based learning now, Dai, here, to um, what came out of that? What, what was the next development of learning? Um, well, the next development, I'd say, from classroom-based learning, as it's so old, uh, was most likely home learning. So um, students would then end up learning at home, uh, whether it be because parents felt like they weren't learning enough or correctly at school, or whether the parents thought they could do a better job, or whether children just themselves said, uh, Mum, Dad, I'd rather learn from you. Um, so, I mean, from there... So I, I just on home learning, am I right thinking in the UK, it's not illegal to learn at home? The law says that your child must be taught doesn't say where the child needs to be taught. So if you were teaching them the curriculum or a mm -hmm. curriculum, okay, uh, you as a parent could teach them from home and you wouldn't be breaking any laws? Uh, yes, I, I, I think so, well, unless, I, unless I'm not up to date with the laws. Okay, great. So, so home tutoring became, and this is more of a one-to-one -one where you're getting, uh, I, I presume it's the same as classroom-based, but it's one teacher or one parent working with one student? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's more one-on-one. -on -one. So I guess what that makes the uh, student feel, the learner, it makes them maybe feel more important or more, uh, uh, more as if there's uh, less distractions around. Um, mm. um, and they probably feel a lot more free from embarrassment from their peers. Uh, they'll be able to ask more and more questions because they won't have the fear of looking silly or, or looking uh, not as smart as their peers, uh, for example. So I suppose that's, that's the advantages of doing that. I, I mean, yeah. I can ream off a number of disadvantages I would think of. One is um, the discipline of actually starting at 9 o'clock, um, having your regular breaks and finishing at 3.30 or whatever it is, um, because if it is mum or dad learning, something always comes up, having been a parent myself, yeah. yeah, and it's urgent, and so you say, okay, we'll do this tomorrow, we'll do this tomorrow, and some of that, uh, you know, learning is interrupted. Yeah? yeah, and so it's getting into that. And secondly, I suppose the social interaction skills as a child that you learn, yeah. you would miss because you're not, you're not in with other yes, children. Exactly. You're in that uh, bubble, if you like, at home. So you may be getting excellent, qualitative learning academically, but you're missing out on the social interaction. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with you 100% on that. Um, you do miss out on a lot. Um, however, I mean, in, in terms of, let, let's take the social aspect to a side. If we were going to say um, things come up, for example, uh, a phone call or another meeting or mum or dad has to run out, one of the other kids are at school, something's happened, whatever the reason may be. Um, what a lot of parents, um, I think, tend to miss is that learning isn't necessarily just sitting, reading 
and soaking in information. A lot of learning is done through playtime, which is why I think they encourage not only to give the teachers a break, uh, but, the, but they also encourage playtime in schools because those interactions, even if you're only playing on your own, even if you're not interacting with other children, you're always interacting with something, uh, whether it's Lego, whether it's driving a, a, a toy car around or digging up mud looking for worms. There's, there's always something to be learnt while you're doing that. How the Lego pieces join together or how it could fit in a different way from what you're usually used to. Uh, cars being able to, let's say, drift sideways, for example, toy cars. And realising if, if a kid's playing and they're digging in the mud, they're trying to find worms, they'll realise timing is very important in that sort of stuff. Ob observing what the surrounding is. So again, it might not be textbook learning, but they're still learning something. So uh, I think that that aspect of something coming up and not being able to teach them from the textbook wasn't necessarily a, a minus or, or a negative unless the, the parent made it a negative. Okay. Said, I don't have time anymore and, and neglected the child for a while. Okay. Could have said, play with this, learning games, even, even crosswords, for example. Do something, entertain yourself while I can't teach you, and we'll come back to this lesson sure. later. Okay, um, so let's move on from home learning then. All um, right. What, what was developed next? Uh, from home learning, I think it went, uh, went into open universities, open, uh, open lectures, and, uh, and online learning. Um, so e-learning, electronic learning, uh, what it actually is. I think it came out to, uh, as the internet started coming out. I, th I, think, uh, I think the LMS learning management system, I think it was created in the early 1900s. Giving your age away now, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and, and from there, what it was is just managing different ways of learning. Uh, in terms of open university and online e-learning, um, it made information more digestible, first of all, videos, pictures, more uh, visual audio learning. Um, and it also made it more easily accessible. So if someone couldn't afford a textbook, they'd be able to go online. Or so they'd... it's more cost effective as well? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I mean, you've mentioned Open University a few times, just for our viewers. What that is, is where you sign up to a university program. But instead of physically going into a university and attending lectures, all the uh, uh, textbooks or all the information that textbooks contain are sent to you online. And you actually interact with your tutors online. Um, you send your work in by email. It's marked, sent you by email. So everything is done at a time that suits you. So Open University sort of thing. Um, and generally, I think e-learning suits people who are maybe working full-time and they want to do a part-time learning or they've got other commitments and cannot do a nine till three or a nine till five every day and therefore they do their chunks of learning whenever it suits them um, and that's where the Open University courses came in. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Kind of hit okay. the nail on the head. Um, and as, as you've said, as the internet has developed, the e-commerce, e uh, or should I say e-learning, not commerce, e-learning offer has gotten bigger and bigger, hasn't it? Oh, it's, it's, it, it's grown immensely, especially over the last 15 years, um, where people, people have started becoming more technological advanced themselves, being able to create things themselves, uh, then decide to, to create uh, videos, even YouTube, for example. A lot of people use YouTube nowadays to learn. Uh, but e-learning itself, it was videos, uh, multiple choice quizzes, for example, made for very specific subjects. Um, so what that allowed people to do is, rather than going on to a place and looking for what they need, they'd be able to just type in, I would like to learn mathematics. And search engines would ba basically bring out lots of different e-learning for, for mathematics, same for science and other subjects. Right. Now, what are the disadvantages of e-learning? I mean, um, learning on your own or learning with a computer, in your opinion, what sort of disadvantages have you got with that? In my opinion, disadvantages would be more, uh, they're not necessarily measurable. So it's not because you've taken a course that you've guaranteed that you've learned something. Or, or by watching a video and answering a few questions, it doesn't necessarily mean that you learn something in that video. You may be answering questions that you already knew the answers to beforehand. Maybe you learned one or two small things. And at the same time, uh, coming away from being measurable, you don't know if the person's actually paying attention. So for example, if they have to watch a video or read a PDF and then go through to answer a few questions, 
it's not through the answers of those questions that you know that they learned something. Have you been watching my that. learning while I've been doing it? Um, <laughs> uh, well, we'll, we'll keep that for off the cameras. Um, but no, uh, um, generally I, I do find e-learning is just way too easy to fall asleep at. In many cases, people that are putting out the e-learning, they're doing it simply to, to check a box. I've done my job. I put a bit of e-learning out there. Let's see how it goes. Measuring is extremely important, especially in today's world. I mean, being able to measure the outcome of what your e-learning is, is actually doing, you'll be able to know if it's doing what you wanted it to do, if it's having the opposite effect, or is there another method that you should be looking for that could maybe increase the, uh, the impact? Well, I, I mean, I, I agree virtue of everything you've said. And like I say, you know, some of it comes back to me because I've done a lot of e-learning myself. I used to have an e-learning center. So yeah. um, I, in the early days when computer-based training came out um, and it was another way of getting businesses to actually allow their staff to learn because they didn't have to give them time off, a full exactly. day off work and so on. Yes. I remember I had a conversation with a colleague of mine. We used to sit on a board together and he was the uh, London director of a BT. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about, and he couldn't, he couldn't understand why small businesses, and when I say small, I meant businesses that employ up to nine, ten people, why they were not allowing their staff to go to breakfast meetings and take a day off and go to training. And, mm -hmm. you know, we went round and round and said, look, we're paying all this money for all these courses and they're not turning up and it's money wasted. You know, why isn't it happening? Um, and I was on the board as somebody who ran a small business mm -hmm. in those days. And so he turned around and said, absolutely, you're a small businessman. Tell us why isn't it happening? And, and to me, you know, I simply told, put myself in that shoes of why wouldn't I give my staff time off? And I said, the issue is, Peter, you know, and I can't remember the exact numbers. I said, how many people do you employ? And he gave me a hundreds of thousand figure. I can't mm. remember exactly what it was. And I said, right, okay, let's assume I employ 10 people, yeah. okay? And if I have to give three people time off to go on a training course, that's 30% of my workforce. Now, can you give 30% of your workforce time <laughs> off to go on a training course? And he said, ah, okay, I see what you mean, <laughs> all right? Because yeah. if you haven't done something like that, you just don't, you know, yeah, the con exactly. in, in large corporates, the concept is regular learning. And it's good, it is the right concept. But what you do as a big business is small. And this is where online training came in. And this is when I create my center as well to try and get small businesses involved. Mm -hmm. And for them to say, well, you know what, go and take a two hour break in that side room save the travel time and do some learning, for example, or do some learning from home or, or whatever yeah. it is. Um, and that worked well, but I mean, hands up myself, I, I've been on courses and where you said, you know, you go through a video, you go through some learning and then you have to answer some questions at the end. Um, yeah, sometimes I have gone straight through the questions and attempted them and gone through and probably got eight out of 10 or 18 out of 20. Have I actually learned anything? Hmm, it's probably what I already knew. I haven't probably learned mm. anything new because there wasn't anyone there to physically watch me learning, is what you were saying. Yeah. Whereas with a classroom-based uh, learning, the teacher will take you through every single exercise and so on before you set your exam at the end, end yeah. of the year or whatever. And so e-learning, I suppose, the, the advantage is you can pick and choose what you want to learn, but there are sometimes bits that you deliberately miss out because you don't think you need to learn them, yeah. but they are important. Yeah, the, the, the biggest positive I find from e-learning is the accessibility. I mean, there's tons of information available on such short notice nowadays. I mean, e-learning, it's, it's a good thing. But for me, it's all about going that one step further than what everyone's doing today. And how do you see, uh, I mean, I know you've created something new, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, do you see e-learning as e-learning developing anymore? Has it gone as far as it can as a concept? Well, I mean, we never stop learning, first of all. But e-learning, if you take the title itself, it just means electronic learning. I mean, we're never going to stop using electronics. So how we use those electronics to help us learn is, is what will change the actual definition of e-learning. E-learning will never die out. I don't, I don't think it will ever die out because we'll always be like using... classroom-based learning, I suppose yeah, it won't die exactly. out. Yeah, exactly. Um, because it's a very cost-effective way of doing it. Exactly. But what will happen is... I mean, th this makes me think of animals, the way I say, well, I know we're not animals, but us as human beings, we will begin to be categorized in the future as types of learners. And I think we're in the very beginning stages of that, of understanding who the learner is in order to ensure you're actually helping them learn, 
not just passing on general information, hoping that they will soak it in as well as the guy next to them. Well, it's something over the years that we've seen, you know, we've had uh, young people mainly, um, whereas, you know, 20, 30 years ago, learning difficulties weren't seen as an issue. Mm. Mental health issues weren't yeah. seeing an issue. Um, they weren't identified, they weren't picked up. It's always been an issue, but these young people were not picked up having dyslexia or having some other form of learning difficulty. And either the young person thought, I'm stupid, I can't do that, everyone else can do that, and they withdraw, they move yes. away from learning and they turn to you know, other things and so on. Um, or the parents thought, you know, my child is X, Y, Z. Or the teacher just thought, you know what, well, that child is just, you know, stupid because they didn't have the concept of picking. But over the years, we've got a little bit smarter now in identifying those problems, mm -hmm. um, providing extra resources and different means of learning for people with dyslexia or, yeah. or, or, or other forms of learning difficulty. Um, and, uh, you know, things have developed and people have got a lot better on that. Yeah. Um, and through that, we could design something which is bespoke to the individual, um, similar to having an academic learning and a vocational learning. I, I do a lot of talks to schools and I, you know, for me, academia isn't for everyone. You know, there are some people, some young people, um, even adults who would actually learn more from doing something vocationally on the job. Yeah. Okay, they will learn than sitting in a classroom going through a textbook or on learning or something. Sounds like you've done some research on me before I got in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, viewers, we've come to another break now, so do stay tuned with us. And in the uh, final part of the show today, we will go through a different form of learning, which uh, Dahir is working on at the moment. Um, and let's see, I don't know what it is as well, so I'm looking forward to hearing about it, question him. Um, and let's see if it's something that uh, you might try doing. So stay tuned. Hi, welcome back uh, Venus TV viewers. It's uh, the final part of the show, how time flies when you're enjoying yourself. Um, we're talking about education today and we're talking about the different types of learning. You know, as individuals, we learn through our lives, throughout our lives we're learning, but we're using different modes of learning. And we talked about classroom-based learning in the first section of the show today, which is, you know, with the teacher, pretty much what all our children do at the moment. And then we moved on to home tutoring. We also looked at online and e-learning computer-based learning, open university, call it what you like, but learning at a time which suits you, but also learning on using a computer or, or a smartphone, if you like. And today's guest, Tahir, with us is a bit of a skills expert in helping people learn. And they're working on a new concept of learning, which is the next development, as he calls it. So let's talk to Tahir and see how we're going to move on from e-learning. So Dyer, explain it to a layman, somebody simple like me who can understand what this concept is <laughs> going to be. Because I know you work in a corporate sector, but, uh, you know, talk to us, talk to my viewers. We're not corporate people, yeah? Okay, Okay, so enough. tell us, what is this new concept? All right, so um, it works in two stages. Um, so the, there's one concept which is scenario-based learning, where uh, what you learn in theory, you get to put into practical uh, the practical learning basically so learning as you're really doing so what I mean by scenario based learning is you place the learner into a real life scenario whether it's something they would face on a day-to-day -day personal life uh, uh, learning uh, sort of uh, sort of thing or whether it's going to be in in corporate whether it's in the company learning situations that you're likely to face on a day-to-day -day basis now, with scenario-based learning, what that would allow the learner to do is make choices of what they think is the best option to do in that certain situation, and then see the outcomes of the choices they make. So whether it's a negative or a positive, there's no right or wrong in this. It's you're making mistakes to learn, or you're not making mistakes to show that you already know what you're doing, for example. So with scenario-based learning, that's, that's the major thing, Going, moving forward, allowing yourself to see the outcomes of your choices. So when you're then faced with that situation in real life, you know whether, uh, which, which choice you should choose basically, what to do. Because when you've done it in the simulation, whether it was through um, visual, facial emotions by one of the characters in the simulation, or whether it was points going up on the screen, uh, bling bling with 10 points for X skill, um, you will remember the choice you made, whether it had a positive or negative effect in the simulation, and whether or not you want to have that same effect in real life. So that's one thing, scenario-based learning, really putting the person into a practical situation 
and learning the outcomes of their choices, then being able to practice that time and time again. So it's not you do the simulation once and then you move on to the next. Keep coming back, try different options. There might be five correct answers, five correct choices to make for a situation. But out of those five, which is the outcome you're actually looking for? So one might make a customer very happy, for example, in customer service training. One might make the customer ecstatic and, and then go and spread, uh, spread good news about your customer service. Do you just want them to be happy and walk away as a happy customer, or do you want them to go around spreading word of mouth? So which of the two options would you like to see the result of in real life? Another avenue that we're exploring is gamified learning. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it ourselves. Okay. Before, before you move to gamify learning, I mean, I've got a ton of questions coming up. Yeah, uh, Scenario-based learning sounds great. Is this still done in a training room? Is it done online? Because the methods are still the same, aren't oh, they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. It's just a different way. So, so how are we linking this? Okay, so um, what we're doing currently is uh, it's like a virtual training suite. Um, you have a, a number of softwares which will allow you to create the sort of stuff you need. Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? So, so the people you're training, are you training, say, 10 or 20 people at the same time in a okay. classroom They're with familiar. textbooks, but actually giving them scenarios and doing that? Or is it a case like, which I think you were going to say, is that you create an online uh, scenario for them and they are working step by step, ask three questions, and if they answer this question, that door opens, and then if they answer the different question, a different door opens, and they're, they're weaving through this scenario um, to get to the end, end, end game, but they're answering questions as they go through, which is the learning that they're yeah. doing. And if they get it wrong, then start again and just use a different maze. So it's going through a maze, well, if you like, yes, yeah, and using exactly. different routes. Yeah. Um, however, it's all done in a virtual environment. So there's, there's no damage to the outside world, for example. So whatever you decide to do, it's within that virtual simulation. So it's on a computer. So either on a computer, mm. on your phone, or on a tablet. So we're really trying to make learning more mobile, more easily accessible. Uh, for example, I mean, I'm sure you've probably seen lots of people uh, playing games or watching YouTube videos on the train on the way to work. does it 24 hours on the well, sofa. There you go. <laughs> Imagine him doing that, but actually yeah. learning something as he's doing it. Um, and again, mobile and virtual. So it's in your, in your own space, in your own time, in a real virtual environment. So it's a real life situation, but in a non-damaging environment. So go for it, make the mistakes, choose the most uh, negative answer or the, the most undesired answer and see what the outcome of that answer would be. And then decide, is that the sort of outcome I want in real life when I'm playing? Mm. So, so, yeah, so, so is that maze then? So, yeah. you know, we, we're in the Branching middle of a maze. Scenarios. We want to come out of that maze and there's 20 different ways of doing it and you keep going, you hit a dead end, you come back, start again. But the way you're doing it is in, if it's in a business environment, it's making particular decisions on a product, when to release it, what type of marketing and so on exactly. and see if that works. And if it doesn't work, come back and maybe try have a different, a different strategy and try that through until you find the right strategy, the right product, the right the route to market, the right profitability, the right everything, yes. which then gets to your desired outcome. Exactly. And you can do all this in a, in a simulation yes. um, environment. Um, exactly. you know, it's like our pilots, for example, they, they make their practices in a simulator. Yes, exactly. yeah, so that when they're yeah. landing, they land first time, yeah. but they probably practice 100 times and crash 99 times yeah. Until, yeah, yeah. until they perfected it. And exactly. then they realize, you know, I need to do it at this speed, I need to have the nose up and the throttle up here and so on. Exactly. And that's where you're looking to put the learning where make mistakes, but make them before you do something in real life. Yes, exactly. I mean, imagine okay. being able to um, sit an exam. So let's say uh, oh, GCSE is almost at O levels there. Uh, imagine sitting a GCSE exam, um, getting the results back, but being able to see all of the answers that you gave, which were correct and incorrect, being able to then try again On the and again answers. and again yeah. until you come out with a perfect score. Okay, no, that, that is good, that's good. And, okay, so you move on, you, there was a, a second part. Uh, so yeah, the second part was gamified. So again, going to that question, I'm sure you see lots of people just playing games. What's this, this candy crush mm. on, on the train? I was um, quite good at that, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there, there's some secrets in there you should know. Um, but it, it's, it's all entertainment. People nowadays, they find learning boring. 
a lot of it's monotone or a lot of it's you have to do this, otherwise you can't do that. Um, so what we're trying to do is create entertaining learning. So they're going through a storyline. They've, uh, they've woken up in the morning. Uh, they're a bit late for work. What's the first thing they do? They get to then interact with the game as if it's their life, sort of like The Sims. But it's them making real choices of how it would be for them in real work life. So when you go into the office, you open the door, what's the first thing you do? Take off your jacket, greet your receptionist, blah, blah, blah. Small little interactions. But with each interaction, you add a human emotion to it. So regardless of what the emotion is, whether it's happiness, sadness, uh, laughter, crying, each and every single emotion that you're faced with will have an impact on you. You'll remember something, it's your action. You done or said this, and it made that person laugh or cry. You're going to remember what that action was because of the because of the reaction that you got. And then going through a gamified learning scenario, what that allows you to do is entertain yourself while still learning. So you might even make silly choices just for the sake of entertainment. But when you're faced with that again in real life, you're going to go back to maybe not the simulation, but the game that you played that said, hey, actually, i done this in the game. Let me try that in real life. So, so you're, inter you're interacting learning with games. So mentally, I suppose, I'm entertaining myself in playing a game, but I'm actually learning from that game rather than just speeding round around a track or killing people as modern yeah, games. Yeah, said exactly. To me. Yeah. As modern game, you could say, I suppose, you're learning as a soldier in modern games, as my yeah. son said to me when yeah. I said, why someone I said, Dad, if I join the army, you know what? I'm very good at shooting people. And I said, okay, do you want to join the yeah. army? <laughs> no. So I said, so why are you practicing yeah. killing people? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it's a way of uh, actually learning, but in a relaxed environment or where you're actually spending leisure time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's creating... I, I can see maybe how this would work in a corporate environment, if you like. Um, do you think this sort of learning would actually come into our curriculum in any way? Well, I mean, it might do. Let's say, for example, when you've got um, uh, special needs kids, for example. Someone's a bit, uh, some of them are not so good at reading, very good visually, very good memory, for example, but just can't read and write very well. You'll be able to put them into. Uh, you'll be able to provide them with um, a science game, for example, uh, where they will be able to, let's say, uh, just for argument's sake, you give them the periodic table, and say, um, select two chemicals to see what happens. Put them together and see what happens. Exactly. So they'll be able to select one, select the other one, and then a, sh a short video or a short uh, animation of an explosion or, or CO2, a bubbling. CO2? Yes. That would work? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'd love to be able to create <laughs> CO2 uh, just using, uh, I'm, I'm not very good in science, but uh, I'm sure it's possible. But they'll be able to learn that sort of stuff. So at the same time as someone who's doing it practically in real life and might create uh, a hole in the table, for example, in a science lab, mm. they'll, they'll be able to do the same experiment on their phone. Mm. And if they're not very good at reading or, or following following instructions, for example, you'll be able to allow those children to continue doing that in those situations. I suppose it will also be good for those um, children or adults who seem to think learning isn't for them, mm. I can't learn, I'm, you know, for whatever reason, not learning, you're actually introducing them and saying, okay, well, look, here, play a game, or look, let's do a, a scenario here. And, and you're not actually learning, but through the back door, you're getting them or pulling them back into a learning yes. environment where they are actually learning. Um, yep. It could be children with autism or something else where, you know, sometimes I don't want to do that, I can't do that, yeah. but through another mode, they've actually done what you want them to well, do. Exactly, and they've learned exactly the curriculum you needed them to. All you've done is adapt it to their learning style. And once you create these scenarios, you talked about tailor-making. Are these a case like, if you created this, in, because I presume it's all about coding and putting stuff together, it, it can only work for one company or one school, or is this something that the same thing can be used widely, or does it need tinkering? Same thing can be used widely. So, um, I mean, a lot of these simulations, yes, they take a lot of coding, a lot of graphic, uh, graphic artists' uh, involvement, etc. But there are tools out there nowadays that don't require you to know how to code. I mean, you can create a very simple branching scenario in the space of 30 minutes on your own, on a computer, 
Whereas a year ago, or five years ago, in some cases even a year or two ago, um, it would have taken a team of coders, a team of developers. So let, let's say five people, a couple of front end, back end developers, graphic artists, and an instructional designer to put that all together. All of that would have taken a team a couple of weeks. With the tools that we have today, uh, um, uh, you'll be able to basically have one person do all of that same amount of work in the space of hours, days, or weeks, or okay. even a week. Great. Well, look, Dai, thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, I've certainly learnt uh, quite a bit about uh, what the next stage is. So next time my employer or somebody tells me, hey, play a game, I'm going to actually watch. Am I learning or am I playing a game? Um, <laughs> and better, I'm coming home and we're going to look at what games you're playing yet and we'll see if we can introduce some uh, uh, learning element into it. But no, viewers, I hope you uh, found that uh, very helpful. Um, for me, learning is a lifelong experience. We start as, as children and we carry on learning and we learn something new. Um, as we go through life and uh, there's no harm in having uh, different options certainly I know from my mistakes in the past had I had something on the computer and played out a scenario um, and made the mistakes and fine-tuned it I probably would have got it right in real life so watch out for these scenario based uh, learning tools that will be available on the market at any time um, and uh, next week um, it's our uh, Christmas Eve show so we'll be uh, having a show around Christmas um, if you'd like to uh, join me here in the uh, studio please give us a uh, venus tv a call um, and tell us uh, why you'd like to be on the show i'm, there you go. I'm giving you an option anybody who wants to come into the show next week on our christmas eve show to talk about christmas give us a call at venus tv and tell us what you would like to talk about otherwise join us through the telephone we'll have a few live guests and we'll talk about what christmas is what it means to us how we enjoy christmas the queen's message at three o'clock in the evening, uh, afternoon, should I say, okay, um, and a whole heap of other things. So have a great week, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.